Hey, board gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here back with another episode of Gumbo Live, the number one Facebook Live talk show dedicated to board gaming. Chris, it's the only Facebook Live talk show dedicated to board gaming, but we're holding on to that number one position. Yeah, I we think got if you had competitors, you'd be number one. So. That's wrong. Thank you. I appreciate it. Our special guest tonight, you heard his voice, Chris Ray of the Opinionated Gamers, big site, lots of uh, great reviews and talk about board gaming. He's a board game reviewer. He writes for OG as well as a contributor to What Did You Play This Week, if I remember right. Uh, you do a little bit of writing for them, or, or is that right? You do a little writing for them? Yeah, I do writing for them, and I also write for Counter Magazine and uh, Gamers Alliance. And you are prolific on BGG, too. You've got a lot of good writing there. Hit us up on social media tonight if you have some questions at Board Game Gumbo on Twitter or Facebook.com slash Board Game Gumbo. Or, of course, you can always send us an email, BoardGameGumbo at gmail.com. Hey, Chris, some show notes before we begin. On the blog side, which is a proud member of – I don't have a producer, so I have to run all these things myself. <laughs> the, uh, on the on, We're a proud member of Punchboard Media. This week we did an inside look at a really cool game, Legends of Sleepy Hollow. It's from Dice Hate Me Games. It's a uh, dungeon dives adventure style game, but not with your typical zombies or um, other kind of themes like that or, or fantasy tropes. It's Americana, early Americana, which Dice Hate Me Games does great. I played the prototype now five times, and I, I'm in love with this game. So he, Chris uh, Kirkman from Dice Hate Me Games gave me permission to go deep into it and actually do some spoilers. So if you really want to know what's behind the scenes just on Chapter 1, uh, take a look on the blog. On the video side, I had my buddy Alex Goldsmith from the Dukes of Dice on. He's the chief noisemaker at Gray Fox Games. And he came to talk a little bit about their new game coming out, Bushido. It's coming out on Kickstarter next month. And also we talked about the big uh, unrivaled tourney that he and Sean uh, helped host with Will Wheaton from Tabletop. That's awesome. So a good episode. Uh, let's introduce a special guest, though. Enough talk about <laughs> enough talk about the show stuff. Chris Ray from the Beninated Gamers, Counter Magazine. Uh, what did you play this week? BGG reviewer. He's back from Eschen Spiel. Welcome to Gumball Live, man. We are really excited to have you here. It's an honor to be here. I've never done any video before, so this is my first time. So I apologize uh, for my amateur nature. I am a written reviewer only. So well, let's break it in. For those people that don't know you, and I don't know why they'd be watching this show if they don't know who Chris Ray is, just give us the quick elevator pitch on your background. So I started gaming back in 04. A roommate showed up with a copy of Settlers of Catan, which is a familiar story among gamers. Sure. And uh, when he showed up, I we fell in love with it. And over the years, I bought a few more games. I bought the Carcassones, the Ticket to Rides. And back in 010, I went to grad school, and I uh, fell in love with games. We played hundreds of games of Seven Wonders. And then slowly things snowballed, and I started writing reviews back in 13, 14, and uh, – I think I've written 150 reviews at this point. Wow. And I do convention coverage from most major American conventions. So uh, all written, though, which uh, these days is a dying art, but uh, I still love it. So, You know, we had Ted Elsbach on. Uh, you and I were talking right before the show started from Bezier Games, and I found out from a friend of mine who knows Ted really well. And, of course, I didn't bring it up on the show. I don't know why. I forgot to. I meant to talk about it. But he is still a big fan of written reviews. It's like his go-to he likes to read and, and dive into, just like me and you. I'm assuming you're like me. You yeah, still read the written reviews. Yeah, and he, he's actually a member of the Opinionated Gamers. So uh, we uh, he doesn't write for us much anymore, but uh, he does love the written review. And, you know, along, among people who have been in the hobby for a long time, I think written reviews are still pretty popular. Um, but the video reviews have a slight advantage in that it's easier to see how a game is played than, you know, just reading it in a written review. So the video is always going to have a leg up on written, but uh, in terms of just raw ability to read what's going on and read thoughts on a game, I, I still love the written side. So, so I, I, I got into gaming, board gaming, hobby board gaming, I guess we'll call it, uh, around 2008-ish, but I've been playing games all my life, pr probably similar to you, yeah. like you said earlier. And one of the disappointment, disappointments I have is I'm, ma I'm married to a woman who's from New Orleans. Th that's not the disappointment, by the way. <laughs> It's, it's just the opening to the story. I'm married to a woman from New Orleans, from the from Kenner, actually. And I'm, for the last 30 years, I've been going to Kenner and Jefferson Parish. I was a Magic player, and I played a little bit of other games. But I, I just didn't know about BGG back then until about around 2007 or 2008. And I didn't realize that when I was going to those Magic stores, as much as I love board games and I've played them all my life, but didn't know about the German games and the Euro games that we play now, I didn't realize one of the guys from Opinionated Gamers was playing games right there on the West Bank, uh, Greg, Greg Schlossinger. 
Oh yeah, Greg, and Greg is a legend of this hobby. So I think if you uh, added up uh, the number of written reviews ever written, Greg would probably have more than anybody. He's probably over three or four hundred, yeah. uh, and uh, he is the editor of Counter Magazine and uh, sure. awesome guy. I see him twice a year at Golf Games and. Uh, just to, when I when I discovered him in finding the dice tower around eight or nine and listening to him do his occasional, you know, tidbits on the dice tower and, you know, finding him on the net and on BGG and all and such a prolific guy. And then to find out, oh, my God, he's right there in the West Bank. Had I just picked up the hobby a little earlier before he moved to Tennessee, you know, I might have been able to go to some of those events that he used to do or, or be part of the West Bank gamers and, and really get into the hobby even earlier than I did. So, man, what a yeah. missed out on that chance. Have you have you met Greg? Uh, yeah, so I go. He hosts a little convention called Golf Games. It's a uh, sure. invitational. He hosts it each falls in, uh, or sorry, each summer's in a different city, and then each winter's in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so I see him there. I see him in a couple of other things. Uh, you see a stack of games sitting behind me right there. Sure, uh, sure. Those are from Essen. Those are for Greg, actually. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was. So couldn't make it this year. No, I was his Essen mule. Uh, he ah. hasn't been in a few years, but yeah. Uh, I'm a huge fan of him. Uh, I always say he's my favorite reviewer, and so I always, I always love seeing him. Uh, well, well, the other thing is that I, in picking you up, I, I, I have been reading you without putting all the connection from all the places that you are. One of the articles that you write, I forgot you wrote. You did this series on the SDJ winners. Yeah, and so that, that's how I got my start as a reviewer, and it's. I, I've, I've discovered it later, and I've been tracking with it. Now, I, I'll be honest. I haven't read the whole thing. It's one of those things where I've bookmarked the page, and if I'm in an elevator waiting for a while or if I'm on a bus or something like that, I pick it up and I go, oh, let me check out one more uh, SDJ winner. And I didn't put the connection that that's you, the same guy from OG and all these other places. So Yeah, well, uh, well thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, that's, um, I still think it's the most fun project I've ever worked on in my life, professionally, personally, anything. Right. And I still write game histories where we discuss sort of how a game came into existence and how it got published. And I'm actually uh, working with Brandon Kemp from um, What Did You Play This Week, a punch board site. Uh, and Brandon and I are interviewing Reiner Knizia tomorrow morning about oh, the history nice. of modern art. So uh, that's the next article is, uh, you know, modern art's been around for 25 years. And I, I have never been so excited to write an article in my life. So well, I'm, a, I'm a little jealous of Brandon because if I remember right, he's got a copy of the new. Oh, no, it's you that has the new. Uh, the new both do. Yeah, so oh, you both, both do. Both okay. Copy this and, yeah. Okay. Je suis jaloux on that one because I, I'm, I, I've always wanted to play modern art, but I love the oink games that I've played. And to see that tiny little box, well, I get—I think it's a little bit bigger than the Deep Sea Adventure it's like box. The double right? box, so it's yeah, the two point games, right? Uh, you know, pushed together, it's all one box, but which is still small. Yeah, it's still tiny, and it comes with a little easel. It's adorable. So, uh, you know, Oink does cool stuff. Uh, I've actually got—I'm doing all of my research on modern art tonight, so I apologize for doing this, but I've got the Chinese version of modern art here. Nice. Uh, okay. And, uh, yeah. Well, that's, how many how many copies of modern art do you own? I own three, and then Brandon's got two the two versions that I don't own. So we're photographing them for the article. So okay, um, and I'm not good at board game photography. So. so somebody was talking on PB on Punchboard Media the other day. Is there a modern art version that's been that's been changed, but it's the same game engine, but it's with postage stamps instead? Have you yeah. heard that? Yeah, it's, I think it's actually I think it was Oint Games. It's called Stamps. That's I actually really would love to have a copy, but I think copies are going for five hundred to a thousand. <laughs> Sure. Uh, and uh, Oink said they couldn't ever reprint it because of copyright reasons. I don't know the story behind that. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it was Oink. I'm pretty sure it was Oink that published it. Um, it may have been another company. But, uh, yeah, it's a awesome-looking look little game, and it comes in a little tiny box. And uh, I know Ted Allspeck has one, but I don't know anybody else who actually has one. So I have to beg him for um, pictures for our article. Well, there it is. There's Brandon checking in with us saying, hey, Brandon, thanks for watching tonight. Yes, it was stamps, and they are way too expensive. It is. Boy, that's a game I'd like to get. It's That is moved up to my grail game. If I could ever find a copy of stamps, I would love to have it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, that's just one of those that's so phenomenally rare that, you know, I've never actually seen a copy. So even getting pictures of it will be tough. You know, part of the fun of, of playing board games is not only the, you know, the actual physical playing of the board game. But it's also that camaraderie that you develop with other people. But there's a little bit that I also like whenever you break out a cool game that no one has seen before. You know, yeah. let's face it. It's it's fun and exciting to see other people's reactions, not to what you own or collect, to the physical elements of a board game when they get as excited. 
And every time I've, I only own two Oink games, but both games that I've brought out, and when I pop it open, well, actually, I own one and uh, Carlos owns the other one, uh, Deep Sea Adventure. But when I pop out um, a fake artist goes to New York with a group that doesn't know anything about Oink games, and they go, what is this little box? It can't be much of a game. And all of a sudden, you start pulling out all the markers and the pad, and you start playing the game, and they realize, oh, my God, this is a big board game in a tiny little box. Yeah, and they're so innovative. I mean, they they do amazing work. Uh, yeah, they've got to be one of the most cutting-edge publishers. And, you know, we all have that problem as game buyers where we get so many board games that we run out of space. And you can never really run out of space for Oink games because they are all just the size of a couple decks of cards put together. Where, where do you Where do you rank them? In their publisher oh, or the games or the yes. uh, I think a fake artist goes to New York is my favorite of sure, uh, sure. players, uh, but I love social deduction games. Uh, Deep Sea Adventure is up there. Um, the only one I've ever not enjoyed was uh, In a Grove. Um, and I don't know why that one didn't click with me, but Insider was fantastic. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce this. Koba Yakaba. Yeah. Uh, it's a simple mechanic, but it's you know it's a lot of fun. Uh, I think I've played almost all of them uh they've got a couple of rare ones and a couple of their games have gone on to get bigger releases so i think it was called dungeon of mandem or something like that it was released as welcome to the dungeon uh okay. a couple of their games have gotten you know bigger wider that, releases. that's welcome to the dungeon and welcome back to the dungeon is a game that is a staple in our group i mean that yeah. is always whenever we're at the end of the night and somebody's finishing up a big game and we can't close up the room yet bradley and i look at each other and go Welcome back to the dungeon. Yeah, <laughs> yes. it's one of those cool, you know, everybody loves pressure luck games. And oh, yeah. One of the cooler ones. So um, yeah, they they do they do a fantastic job. I mean, they're they're one of the publishers to watch, and I, I love how they continually gain traction. BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, Gumbo Live. I've got Chris Ray from the Opinionated Gamers on a bunch of other sites, a prolific reviewer uh, here tonight. We've got Steve O'Rourke checking in, uh, the name father. Love Zoink, too cool to be so small, too cool to be so small. That is true. That's that's probably a good tagline for Oink, too yeah. cool to be so small. You know what's cool about Oink? Um, I've only started going to conventions the last couple of years, but they were never there. And now they seem to be opening up to the to to go into Essen, maybe even coming to the American conventions. Yeah, so they were at Essen this year, and they had a wildly popular booth, I think because of the small version of modern art. So I actually <laughs> – Sorry, I've got a little bit of a cold. I was, uh, I was actually. It's when Essen opens, you're always nervous about what games am I going to get, what games am I not going to get, and you kind of have to rank them and make a path through the halls. It's a little bit of a game in and of itself. And I actually went uh, to Oink, uh, one of the first stands in the morning, and it was crowded already because people wanted copies of Modern Art, um, and they wanted copies of Insider and a lot of their newer releases. But yeah, they are making an appearance at conventions, and they're wildly popular. And I think they're going to continue to be that way because. Their games are so innovative, and there is a need for small box games. So, you know, I, I really enjoy your SDJ articles, the the uh, the history behind the Spiel des Jours. You kind of find the little tidbits that are spread out all over the Internet and put them together. And some of them, it looks like personal research, too, you know, interviews, uh, yeah. discussions. Yeah, but most of them are based on interviews. Uh, a lot of the designers didn't want the interview mentioned because we were doing translation okay. work. I actually worked with a translator. Uh, and uh, – but um, – yeah, it's it's all it's um, it's very detailed, and I think for at least twenty five, probably thirty of the articles in the thirty seven articles in the series, there's an interview with the designer that underlies it. What's what's next? You you are you working on any history articles right now? So we got modern art coming. Um, after that, I always do uh, sort of the game anniversary. So I'll start looking at the twenty eighteen anniversaries. So I've done you know Funk and Schlag at fifteen when Power Grid turned fifteen. I've done. I did teach you turns twenty five. Modern art turns twenty five. So uh, I'm modern art will be my last one of this year. Uh, I still write the history of the International Gamers Awards. Right. Um, and I've got nine years left in that series. And then I uh, whatever twenty eighteen anniversaries we've got, um, I'll start looking at those. Um, I know Agricola is probably one of them that I'll do. Um, and Agricola also won the International Gamers Award, so I'll do that one anyway. But yeah, it's, I, I probably, I, you know, at first that's all I ever wrote. I did, I did those before I did reviews, and I'll probably do five or ten a year from now on. Cool. BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, Gumbo Live, talking with Chris Ray about some of the writings. Chris, you made it to Eschenspiel for, for you know, for people watching this show, they know what that is, but uh, it's the big, it's the biggest convention, according to some people, in the world when it comes to board gaming. And, and, and although I've only been to Gen Con, 
if if Essen is what they say it is, where it's dedicated to board gaming, it must be the biggest because let's face it, as, as much fun as we have at Gen Con, it's not dedicated to board games. Yeah, it's probably, I mean, I would call Gen Con 60, 40 at this point. It's still mostly board games, but a lot of it's RPGs and other, you know, things from, you know, modern pop culture. <laughs> So here's why, here's why I don't think it's, you know, maybe 60, 40 is, is, is ambitious or, or accurate. I don't know, but I'm on the plane coming back and behind me was a uh, Rob Davio's wife who also works for uh, restoration games. I didn't know cause I didn't know her at the time, but I heard her talking and I kind of recognized her voice sitting next to her. Now I'm sitting next to a guy who doesn't play board games. He works in the oil field. He's just coming back and forth. So we talked about the oil field the whole time. But behind them, they're talking board games the whole way back on the flight. I'm, I'm really jealous. But he, she's sitting next to a guy who goes, to, who has been going to Gen Con for ten years, and doesn't play any board games. <laughs> Didn't know who Rob when she said, "Hey, I'm." Is it Melissa or I forget Lindsay, her? Lindsay, yeah. Lindsay. Is, Lindsay. She says, "I'm Lindsay uh, Davio," and uh, didn't register it. I mean, anybody in in our hobby would instantly go, "Oh, oh yeah. are you related to Rob Davio?" Didn't this guy didn't bat an eye? He had never heard of Restoration Games. He had never never heard of Rob Davio. Didn't know what Seafall or any of these other games are. And I'm saying, wow, I'm one seat behind. You know, a chance to at least just talk board games for two or three hours. I didn't miss much because I, I mean, I talked board games for four days, so it wasn't that much of a uh, deal. But 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 Eshin, t- t- tell me the difference between Essen and Gen Con in your mind. So uh, Essen is 100% board games, and I think there's a couple of huge differences. The the <clears throat> biggest difference is actually who goes. So Gen Con is sort of a um, a homage to American geekery, uh, and it's a lot of you know board game fans, RPG fans, pop culture fans that go. Essen is all about the families. So you'll see German grandparents with you know German kids and German grandkids sitting there at the Hans and Gluck stand saying, you know, I really like Carcassonne and I need this new Carcassonne promo. And it's almost strange because I grew up in a gamer family and it sounds like you've got a gamer family, but uh, over there that's really common. And over here that's pretty rare. So whereas most people going to Gen Con are between, you know, 20 and 40 uh, over at Essen, you've got German families of all ages and, um, you know, a lot of them are casual gamers, but they also know way more about games than the average American. And so that's kind of cool. The other big thing I say about Essen is, uh, and people are always shocked by this, so this is why I keep saying it, uh, Gen Con, you can play some games. Uh, at Essen, there is no time to play games, and there aren't any really to play. You can get demos in, and they are full demos, but there's not an open gaming hall at Essen. Most people that do play games either are doing them via demo tables or they're doing it at their hotel at night. There's not an open gaming space. And so those are the two biggest differences, other than the sheer size of Essen. Essen and Gen Con probably have similar turnstile attendance, but whereas Gen Con, there's a few hundred new games that are released at Essen this year. Uh, the press uh, conference said there was going to be more than 1,200. So wow. I don't know how they count that, but it's a, it's a lot of games. So. Well, that brings to mind something I was thinking about Gen Con. Uh, the People that go to local gaming conventions or smaller gaming conventions go to Gen Con like me and say, wow, it's, it's tough to game there. I did game, but at Dice Tower Game, at Dice Tower Con, I probably gamed, I don't know, I think I lost track, 30 or 40 different games outside of the, the booth time between 10 to 4. I, I played at least 30, 40, 50 different games that week. And I go to Gen Con, and man, if I can get in five or six games that week outside of the booth time, you know that's that's a good Gen Con, but I think the difference is if you're if you're used to the smaller game cons that are all about gaming, and you go to Gen Con, then you say there's not much gaming. If you go to Essen, and then you go to Gen Con, you go, wow, Gen Con's all about gaming. Yeah, it's really funny. I had a friend from the UK that had never been to Gen Con, but had been to Essen every year for a decade, and uh, he went to Gen Con this year, and uh, he uh, he was like, it's amazing how many games I got to play. <laughs> and I, I was just laughing because, he, you know, his experience is compared to Essen, which there's just no game go, playing going on. The other thing is Gen Con goes all hours of the night. So uh, I've been there playing Werewolf until 6 a.m. Um, right. And Essen literally closes at 7. And um, there's nothing. I mean, there might be a press event at 730. But, I mean, by, let's say, 8, everybody's out of there. And it's there might be some open gaming at a couple of the hotels if they have a room that they've let people take, but it's pretty gaming dry, which is weird. It's Essen is mostly a shopping trip. So if, 
if you were meeting somebody for the first time who's going for the first time, what what tips would you give them? Yeah, not the practical tips about how to get there, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. To enjoy their experience at Essen, what would you tell them? I would tell them research any game that you want that will be shipped within a couple months. Order it from Cool Stuff or Miniature Market or buy it at your local game store. Because the beauty of Essen is there are, of the 1,200 games released there, the simple reality is most of them will never be released in the United States. Right. I mean, and uh, you've got so much suitcase space. Uh, it's a limited amount. Board games, unfortunately, are, bu are bulky unless you're buying Oink games or something. Uh, and I, my first year, I went over there and I bought Pandemic Legacy, even though I could have had a copy shipped to my door <laughs> for Monday. And, right, right. Yeah, and it's just, it was a waste of suitcase space. So now I try to bring back games and promos and things that I just couldn't get otherwise. And um, and I bring back a lot of games for friends that they couldn't get otherwise. Um, and so that's my biggest advice is you're going to be overwhelmed with the number of unique releases that will never get a release in America. And take advantage of that. I mean, because that's, that's why you made the trip. Um, and so for a person that has been to Gen Con, is there anything about Gen Con that will feel familiar to them? The crowds. Uh, so okay. turnstile attendance is roughly the same at both. Gen Con's actually probably a little bit more crowded just because the S and Mesa is, uh, it has to be two or three times the size of the Gen Con exhibitor hall. Now, if you okay. take Gen Con, the exhibitor hall plus Lucas Oil Stadium, which I've never actually bothered to wander into, um, it's probably similar sized, but the uh, exhibitor halls at Essen feel slightly less crowded to me just because there's more space. Okay. BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with another episode of Gumbo Live. I have Chris Ray, uh, reviewer extraordinaire, who just came back from Essen. I'm assuming you finally got over the jet lag. You're back in uh, normal yeah. mode. You know, the, the thing on everybody's mind is, and I'm sure you've been asked this a million times by the people that know you went, what was your top games? What did you see that got you really excited? You you obviously have a great blog uh, series on there uh, that you were doing a day to day. But now that you've had some time to let it sit in a little bit, what, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are you saying? So I'll, I'll throw out two. So first of all, I have to admit my bias. <clears throat> Sorry, I still got this cold. Uh, I have to admit my bias. I like family weight strategy games, so I'm not a big heavy gamer. Um, you know, the hottest games from the convention were probably Clans of Caledonia or Gaia mm -hmm. Project. Those are a bit heavy for my taste. I'll play them. I'll probably like them. Uh, but I look for sort of the – I really like the games that win the Spill of Shars. So the two standouts for me are Azul by Plan B Games. Sure. Uh, it's coming out here in the U.S. They said it'll start shipping at the end of next week. There's been a slight delay. Um, it's a tile lane game. Um, it's just really cool. It's really smooth. And it's the sort of game that I could get my mom to play, which is always something I'm looking out for. It's beautiful. It's well-produced. Um, that's probably my second favorite. It's probably an objectively better game than my first game. But Majesty for the Realm is my favorite. Um, I actually play-tested Majesty for the Realm at a convention back in April when it was called Middle Ages. And I, I fell in love with it when it was in its prototype form. That's the new Mark andre game, right? Yeah, by the guy okay. who's Splendor. Sure. I think better than Splendor. And I'm a guy who's played Splendor 75 times, um, maybe a hundred times. Uh, and I, it's fast. It's simple. I mean, but it's really deep. And I think the better player wins. And I, you know, those sorts of games are actually hard to find and it's really beautiful. Uh, and so I'm just a huge fan of it. It's by the publisher of Carcassonne, Hans and Gluck. Uh, here in the U S it'll be Z-Man that releases it. I loved it so much. I brought back a German copy. Um, and it's, I mean, right now it's probably my favorite game of 2017. So. Well, you're in the right show because Steve and I are, that. I mean, that's really good that I, that I brought you on because I'm always looking for reviewers and I've, and I've read your stuff many, many times. But I, now that I know your bias, I know that our tastes are going to line a lot closer because that's exactly what Steve and I both like. We, Steve and I talk off air a lot and we both like family weight. The STJ was made, was made for me. That's the kind yeah. of game that I enjoy playing. Do I like playing deeper games? Absolutely. And I have fun playing them. But if you ask me what I'm going to bring to game night, it's going to be a bunch of STJ weight type games, you know? Yeah. And not only do I like them, but, you know, games are about the people we play games with. And everybody in my life, uh, even my gamer friends to my family, everybody likes the, you know, the light to medium weight SDJ style games. And so, that's naturally what I've gravitated towards. And you know, when you're a new gamer, you go through the, the various stages and you buy everything from really light games to really heavy games. And I think we all eventually find our sweet spot. And it's a good sweet spot to be in because 
There are awards that make it really easy to tell if we're going to like those games. There's a number of good releases, and because of the lucrative um, nature of the Spiel des Jahres, if you win that award, uh, you'll sell at least 300,000 games. That's the lowest a game has ever sold is 300,000 copies. Wow. Uh, if you win that award, you're going to make a fortune, so publishers target it. So I'm really happy to be in that market, but um, I understand you know, why people really love the heavy stuff. Well, you can see Steve, uh, Steve is enjoying it. I agreed on the level of family weight. Good to hear about Azul and Majesty for the Realm. You know, speaking of those on, on Facebook, I've discovered, I'm, I've been on BGG for so long now. Uh, I've been lurking on BGG back to 2008. I probably registered about four or five years ago when I finally got over the, wow, this, this website is terrible and it's hard to navigate, but I need to just learn it. It took me almost a decade to okay. uh, get an account. I was a long time lurker, but and I still, I use it every day, but I never log in. Yeah. Um, I was wondering when, because I noticed that my registration wasn't until 2012 or 2013. I'm going, wait a minute, I've been playing games for almost 10 years. I mean, hobby games. I mean, what what was I doing? Because I remember going to BGG to find these games. And I looked, I went back on Amazon. It still has it in my card history. I bought Carcassonne in 2007 and Ticket to Ride in the same month back in, two, I'm sorry, 2008 both off of recommendations from the Dice Tower and from um, you know the top 10 lists yeah. on, on BGG. It just took me five or six years to actually work up the nerve to put in a, and you know make an account and start diving in. Now, I love the website. I'm used to it. I'm, you know, it's, it's not friendly, but, but I'm used to it now. But you know, what I've discovered is that there are, when we think, oh my God, there's a bubble that's going to break, it's going to break, it's going to break. I go on Facebook and I find out every single day people that go, Hey, I just heard about this game Carcassonne. What do you think? Should I play it? And I don't laugh at those questions. I love those questions. Yeah, because it's games like Carcassonne and Ticket to Ride that make gamers. I mean, you know, we call them gateway games for a reason. And Board Game Geek is, you know, a charming site, but it's actually really a hard site to use if you're not familiar with it. And the other thing is, People forget this, especially people who are active BGG users. Most gamers do not use BGG. Um, I'm in a meetup group in Kansas City. Kansas City is my hometown. I live in Jefferson City during the week. But Kansas, in Kansas City and, you know, in a group of 40 gamers that meet every week to play, you know, all the newest games, maybe three of us are BGG users. And so I use it to track my collection. Um, I don't really even use it to log plays much. But, yeah, it's it's a hard site. It's a gem of a site. I mean, there's nothing better. And, you know, uh, people in other languages are jealous of Board Game Geek. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's just one that I've never, I, I, to this day, I don't use it as much as a lot of other folks. Well, let me play a game with you. Not a real game, but let me, let me throw out some names for you. I, we, uh, me and a couple of the people, including Brandon, uh, wrote an article for the gumbo called S and Envy. Envy, just a Cajun word for something you really want. You know, you, something you really got to have. You got a, you got a, a hankering for it. And, and there's only five or six games. Let me see if you saw these. And if you did, you know, tell me, tell me, hey or nay, where, where we, were we prescient when we put these on there, or did we pick the wrong games? The, the first one is one that's actually going to be hitting American uh, stores in just a couple of weeks, uh, Coaster Park from Pandasaurus Games, which was the – which was the everybody wanted to play it at Gen Con, but they weren't letting anybody play it. Did you see it? I didn't see it, actually. Uh, and, you know, Essen is so <laughs> big that you miss a lot of games. I know of it because I knew it was, it was one of the hottest pre – um, SN games. So if you look at the BGG hotness, uh, BGG preview, you can sort it by number of thumbs. Uh, and so that was probably number one or two. Uh, and I think I think it was number one at one point. Um, but no, I didn't actually see it. Yeah, if you've if you've ever played Roller Coaster Tycoon on Windows machine or anything, yeah, then Coaster Park is you know that's that's one. And it's got the name. It's got Scott Alms. It's got Panasaurus. So that's a that's a good one. Oh, there's Steve. Not user friendly BGG. He's talking about, but a lot of friendly users. He's yeah, right. You know, the BGG. internet is a scary place these days, but Board Game <laughs> Geek is still a fantastic community. So. Yeah, which is weird because the BGG Facebook page is not as nice as the BGG uh, website, which is weird. But I did find, a, you know, I found a Facebook page you may be interested in. There's this guy, and I'm just starting to get to know him, Chuck Yeager, who runs a Facebook group called Gateway and Filler Games. Oh, that's awesome. And I was like, okay, wait, that's right up my alley. Although I like playing bigger games, play them every week with my with my gamer group. But with my scout dad group, that's exactly what we play. You know, we play yeah. 
We play those type of games. So I, I, I checked in, and I've been on there for a couple of weeks, and I just love it, man. It's all people like us that still like playing the SDJs. They're, they're not that experienced in, in the big, wide world of, of games, so you can actually help them out and with some things. And yet, because there's 1,200 games that come out every year, there's games I haven't heard of, and they're, and they're giving me good names too. Yeah, I know, and it's always hard to find those hidden gems. You know, it's easy to find the ones that win the big awards or on top of the sure. hot. It's hard to find the hidden gems, and so a, a good group like that would be perfect. Oh, check it out. It's called uh, the Gateway Games and Filler Games. Next up on the list is a game I'm a big fan of, and I, I've been begging for an expansion. It's called Not Alone Exploration from Stronghold Games. I don't know the European publisher. Um, I think it's a Greek publisher, but I'm not positive. But Not Alone exploration are you a fan of not alone and did you happen to run into that i i i did run into it i didn't play the expansion okay. um the uh i you know stronghold is one of the booths this year that you kind of had to go to pretty early they had a lot of the hottest games of the convention um i do like not alone quite a bit actually i have never bought a copy but it's a fantastic game uh and you know i i don't know what the expansion does but that would be really intriguing to see I know nothing about it other than the picture that I, that I, that I had on the thing. I, I can't wait to play it though. But there is another game that I know I know you've talked about on your uh, blog post, so I know you're familiar with this one. I'm not sure if you played it because I, I don't remember from your uh, article. But from Quinted Games, Agra was the big talk even before Essen. Did it carry through? Did it keep the buzz going at Essen? Yeah. So uh, I mentioned this in my blog post. I actually discussed sort of what was hot at the convention each year. There are two big lists. There's the Board Game Geek list and the Fair Play list. And I think Agra made it on both. Um, and then one of my fellow – we have a sort of a behind-the-scenes email thread on the Opinion of Gamers. One of my fellow uh, writers, uh, that was the first game they tried when they got home. Uh, and they sent out a little thing, and they absolutely loved it. So, yeah, I think it's living up to the hype. And it looks, it looks like one of those heavier games, but it's definitely one I want to try. Uh, I like the theme, and the game looked really nice. I get attracted to these heavier games, and I'm terrible at them. But boy, <laughs> when when you spread them out on the table, and they've got the beautiful board and the beautiful bits, and and especially in a game like uh, the one that I discovered a couple of years ago uh, that I finally got to play, Dice Tower Con. Uh, it's been on my Grail Games list. Is Concordia? It's been impossible to get until the new reprint that came out. But when it when you start seeing how the inner workings are so elegant and everything just builds up into each other, I keep going, "Oh man, this is just." I like playing those games. The guy who made Concordia actually had a new game come out at SN called... Um, That's Matt Gertz. Yeah, Tra Transatlantic, I think, was the I'm name. Not, I don't know anything about it, no. But yeah, it was really hot. Too too games, I mean, I, yeah, I don't think it made either of the lists, but it was one of those sort of like, you know, like what games have I not heard of that you think are really cool at the convention, and that was one that kept coming up. I think it's called Transatlantic, um, but yeah, it was... It apparently has a similar me mechanic. So next, next up is a game that I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, so you, I'm sure you'll correct me. But this this one came from a lot of podcasts that were talking about this one. It's called Otis by Claude Lucchini. Uh, Otis, Otis, Otis. I, I, I heard it pronounced Otis, but I don't know. I mean, uh, the I think it was the Dice Tower that joked that this sounds like a you know a guy out in rural West Virginia. Um, but <laughs> Otis. Uh, yeah, Otis. So. Um, I didn't get to play it. It looks beautiful. I mean, the publisher behind it is really talented and has done a lot of, um, you know, great games. Uh, Otis, we knew would we could order a couple weeks after Essen, so I didn't bring it back with me. But that was initially what Brandon Kempf of uh, What Did You Play This Week? That was initially what he asked me to bring him back. He actually ended up ultimately asking for uh, Dragon Castle. Um, but, uh, yeah, Otis looked pretty cool, and it was definitely there. And there's yeah. Brandon checking in. Yeah, it is. And I almost asked for Transatlantic to come back, but wasn't sure if we'd play it. So Transatlantic is a little bit, uh, and we, I know we were talking about Otis, but Brandon's bringing in Transatlantic. Is that a little bit of a deeper game more than Concordia? Because yeah. Concordia really is, it's really a simple game. It's just winning the game is not simple. That's yeah, the way I, I like to explain I, it to people. Transatlantic looked like it was deeper. Um, yeah, because Concordia is pretty streamlined. Um you know, it's you're right. It's a simple game to learn. It's a hard game to be good at, um, and I'm not good at it because it's a deck builder, and I've never been good at any deck builder. Yeah. But uh, you know, um, yeah, I think Transatlantic looked pretty looked pretty deep. So, well, you know, back to Otis. I am a sucker for a, a really unusual theme and some really cool artwork, and Otis has both of them. I mean, science fiction diving in this this weird looking civilization that's collapsed. <laughs> That's all you got. I mean, I'm 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 right in there. You know, I want to play it. Yeah, 
yeah, it, it looks cool. And, you know, like I said, it should be, I don't know when it's going to hit U.S. shores, but it looks like we could order a copy from Europe in about two weeks. So we'll definitely be getting that one in when it comes out. The next one is one I think you also said, if I remember right, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it also made a lot of the lists. Altaplano from DLP Games. What do you know about that one? Uh, yeah, that was hot. Uh, that was the game that um, a lot of the early sort of convention speculation, there's a lot of rumors, and some of them end up being true, and a lot of them aren't true. These rumors were not true, but the rumor was that Altaplano would sell out really early. And I think they had, I think it sold exceptionally well, but I think they, um, it, and it did ultimately sell out, uh, but they had a lot of copies on hand. It was one of the five hottest games from the convention. I oh, mean, it, wow. yeah, if you were to put together a list of like what what games just really did great, uh, Altapana would be on them. And I don't, the thing is, I don't know when it's going to get a U.S. release. Um, that's another one where you can order it from Europe pretty soon. Um, so we'll do that um, rather than stuffing it in the suitcase. Suitcase space is a big thing in essence. Sure, sure. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, and people are saying, the people that have played it, I haven't played it, the people behind the scenes that I talked to that have played it, also they liked it better than Orleans, which if that's true, that's a game to watch out for for the year. Yeah, I'm, 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 I got that on my list. Alta Plano, it's one I want to play. I did enjoy Orleans. I love the bag building mechanic, so I want to see what he's been able to do with, with it. So yeah. it's, hey, score one for the gumbo. We did have one on your list that, uh, that was pretty popular. Here's one that Brandon gave me and he wrote up a, a little uh, report about it. I haven't seen it much out there, but I love the guy who did it. Rudiger Dorn has Montana that came out at, uh, at Essen. What do you know of Montana? Uh, so there's a copy sitting right there. Um, oh, there it is, Brandon. Take a look. He's got your copy, probably. <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's that that copy's for Greg Schlosser. Um, oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, I don't know. That's one. I don't know if it'll come out over here either. I don't know what White Goblin's publishing ar- ar- arrangement is. Um, it it didn't make any of the hotness list, but everybody was really looking forward to it. And I don't know if that's because of the theme. So Germans have a um, seemingly a love of the American West, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, as somebody from a almost Western state in Missouri. Uh, but uh, I'm still, by the way, I'm still really proud that Great Western Trail, the goal is to get to Kansas City. Yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> um, but uh, Montana, I think it was a combination of the theme and the designer. But yeah, a lot of people were really talking about it. And that seemed to be the most anticipated of White Goblin's releases. And they had um, Bali, Montana, Claim, all of them were pretty, um, yeah, hot. Yeah, so Brandon's saying, look over my left shoulder. Yeah, there's a copy of, all of the White Goblin games sitting over there for Greg Schlosser. By the way, he says that uh, Alta Plano you can get right now, but it's 105, so it's it's a hot game. Oh, by the way, while we're talking about that, I got to call a little bit of shenanigans, not on you, just on publishers saying it's sold out or we're going to sell out. Okay, tell me how many you brought, and then I'll be impressed because if you bring 200 to Gen Con and you say you sold out the first day, or you bring 2,500 to Essen and you sold out the second day, which one is a hotter game? Yeah, you know? and- yeah, and you know, I have I have to also call shenanigans on this. So I had the good fortune uh, of going to the press conference this year, which is actually on Wednesday, and Essen starts on Thursday. And so I went in, and I was, you know, I go there for shopping too. So I was sort of asking people, you know, when's this going to sell out? When's this going to sell out? Trying to plot my path through the hall on Thursday morning, if I'm being completely honest. And people would say, oh, yeah, this is going to be a really big sellout. But then, like, a lot of them didn't. And it's not that they didn't sell thousands of copies. It's just that they had so many on hand. And whereas at Gen Con, a lot of games sell out within the first five minutes. At Essen, that tends to be really rare. Um, And so, um, you know, they do – publishers do use the sellout hype to hype up the game. Um, I was repeatedly told the Indian Summer would sell out in advance. It did not. Um, It was a very hot game. There was a lot of copies of Indian Summer, though. There were a lot of copies. There were so many copies that they actually had them at the the German equivalent of a uh, a miniature market of cool stuff. They have booths there. They actually had Indian Summer not only at the Spielweise stand, but they also had it at those sort of second second the game distributor stores. And wow. so, yeah, you know, you you can't believe the publishers' hype. And I think at Gen Con, my theory is that some publishers hype their games by having so few copies on hand. Um, I think, um, I mean, not to name names, but, uh, you know, I think that there may have been a little bit of that with Seafall uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, and there, it was that way with uh, a lot of Renegade games this year. So, well, back, well, to, back the, to the other game we were talking, we were talking about, 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 about some of the games that he's had. Yeah, Istanbul. Istanbul. 
Uh, just recently, Karuba and Steam Time. I haven't played Steam Time yet. I watched them play it at our local con a couple of weeks ago. But um, I mean, Karuba is a game right up that weight that we're talking about, right? Yeah, I, I think so. So, and I, I think Montana is probably going to end up in that in that weight. No, actually, Karuba will end up end up being lighter than Montana. I think Montana is a little bit heavier than that. But uh, but Karuba is one of those great games that could have won the Spiel des Jahres and. Um, let's see, it was up against Codename, so it had no chance, but, uh, <laughs> right. yeah, so. Well, well, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, uh, Brandon, I got to say that I think between, uh, Altiplano and Montana, I think the Gumbo, uh, scores, because I think, I think Montana was, was not as hot as Altiplano based on what our guest, Chris Ray has to say. I, yeah, if I had to, if I had to name the five hottest games of the convention, I thought about this in advance, like, well, what I would oh, say ask that. So I'm just, I'm going to ask myself and then throw it out there. I think Altiplano would have easily been one of them. Hey, Chris. Uh, yeah. What are the five hottest games at Essen? Oh, know? I love it. I love it. Uh, I think Altiplano was probably up there. Azul was easily up there. Um, uh, Noria was probably on the list. Uh, that, would, that would I wanted to write about. I mean, that, that was pretty close. Uh, that was a hot pick in our little board game, um, uh, fantasy board game league, uh, Noria. Yeah, yeah, Noria, and I just saw people carrying it everywhere, and they had a lot of copies, which helped. But and it's also by you know publishers that are up on the rise, and then Clans of Caledonia, which was, I mean, for a game that was on Kickstarter to be that hot of Essen is really something. And so uh, that was a, a top one. And then there were just rumors all weekend about um, Gaia Project. I don't know much about it. I didn't care for Terra Mystica to be honest. And so, but I, that one sold out. That was probably the first game at Essen to sell out. Uh, and I know that they were, it was really hot. The, if I had to pick a six, Charterstone was up there. The last two you mentioned, well, not Charterstone, but Clans of Caledonia. I mean, every, everybody in America knows uh, uh, Charterstone if you pay attention to the hobby. But yeah. Clans of Caledonia and Gaia Project had incredible buzz the last month going into Essen. They did. Didn't, didn't you find that? I mean, I just it was like a groundswell coming up as we got closer to Essen. Yeah, and something I always tell people when they watch sort of the pre-convention buzz list is there's a lot of publisher manipulation. I mean, uh, so a publisher can make a game, give it a BGG contest, and really propel it up in the rankings. Gaia Project and Clans of Caledonia, I think, were just natural buzz. I mean, I think that those two games, if I had to pick, those two games will probably make it into the BGG Top 100, and I might be being conservative when I say 100. Uh, the initial reviews of them have been amazing. And the buzz around both of them has just been stellar. Uh, whereas, you know, the other ones on my list, I think we need to see more people playing before we really know. Steve says, sounds very interesting how the designer developed the wheel building for Noria. Did you get a chance to see that wheel building in action? Yeah, so I haven't played it, but I got to see how it works. It looks really cool. Um, so uh, it looks almost like, you know, they call it wheel building, but it looks like the game has a little bit of an engine building component, which is something that I always really like in games. Uh, the cool part about Noria is the designer um, actually won the Spiel des Jahres Fellowship. So they give out fellowships to aspiring game designers, and she actually won it. And so, um, you know, th those are people, those are game journalists who I have an enormous amount of respect for. And the fact that they think she's such an up-and-coming designer, I think, speaks really highly of, you know, the promise of Noria. I am interested. BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, Gumbo Live. I'm talking to Chris Ray reviewer from Opinionated Gamers and a bunch of other games. Any other games you want to mention here while we're talking about it? I know you said that the top ones. It doesn't have to be one of the hotter ones. Well, what was one that just didn't make the list but but excited you a lot? Yeah, so uh, Senators. We played Senators tonight, actually. had a game night. Senators was by Ricky Tata, who's the designer of Q. Have you heard of this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so Senators, we played it tonight. It was actually oh, no Senators. I don't know Ricky Tata. I know who that is, but I don't know. I don't know Senators at all. And I predicted to Brandon that you would name at least two games that I've never even heard of with all the research I've done. I don't know anything about Senators. Yeah, I think Senators is one of the more obscure Essen games. Uh, but it was it's by Lemain Games. That's Ricky. I think that's Ricky Tata's publisher. Uh, and it is a game of competitive bidding, and it's an auction style game. But it's pretty light, and it, it's a lot of fun. We played it. I think we all really enjoyed it. Um, that was one of the more obscure ones to, to name a couple of other games that I think are just really are part of the story of SN 2017 modern art. Uh, I know I'm doing an article on it and I, so I have a, maybe a slight bias, but here's the facts about modern art. Modern art was the biggest game 25 years ago. It, it's a game that's 25 years old. It had three new editions come out of Essen. So, uh, it had a very popular Chinese slash Taiwanese version 
I had the Oink Games version, and then there's a Korean version that is available for pre-order that comes with a gavel and metal coins. And so uh, the, the fact that a game is 25 years old and is that hot at Essen is just amazing to me. Um, I also, I always think, you know, when we mentioned what was really awesome, we should mention the awesome expansions and the expansions that everybody was really looking sure. forward to. The new Ticket to Ride looks awesome. Uh, it, you actually color in the tracks as you go, so you can sort of restrict what's going uh, on. Uh, oh, that's a cool mechanic. Yeah, it is. So, uh, you know, Alan's still innovating years later with Ticket to Ride. Um, so I thought that was one of the hotter ones. Um, but, you know, Essen is one of those places where there are so many weird, rare games. You know, somebody with their dream basically – uh, they don't. People don't sell games out of backpacks like they did 20 years ago. But you know, it's one of those places where you can just find sort of the eccentric games, and um, a lot of those were with the publishers out of Asia. There were 52 countries represented at Spiel as exhibitors. Wow, 52 countries! Isn't that awesome? I mean, I think that's one of the most amazing statistics of the commission. And uh, but yeah, it's just Senators is probably my obscure game that I enjoyed the most. Now you said that there there are no backpack sellers. Um, I mean, it looks like all the booths are, are crazy. And, and and another difference between Gen Con, Gen Con has, has good booths. And then I see the pictures from Essen, and they're like buildings, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like little stores. Are, but are, there, are there no more backpack uh, guys? Because one of my favorite stories, Matt Lee has told this on a couple of different podcasts about how he, I forgot what the name of the game is. He had designed this little game out of the trunk of his car with a buddy. And they just said, whoa, there's this Essen thing where people buy games. Let's bring games to Essen. <laughs> and they just kind of sold it out of the out of their backpacks. Yeah, I think they've opened up so many halls that it's easy to get a booth. I have never encountered somebody selling games out of a backpack. But it's really funny because if you actually look at the history of Essen, that was actually a legitimate thing there. Um, so the guy who designed Alhambra, his name is escaping me right now. Dirk. But, um, yeah, Dirk Kim. Right, Dirk Hen, yeah, yeah. Dirk Hen, I think, right? Uh, yeah. So now, um, I mean, Queen publishes almost all of his stuff, but, uh, but back in the day, uh, Dirk Hen and his wife were selling board games out of backpacks at Essen, and the earliest versions of Alhambra, like it's Alhambra's predecessors, were actually sold out of a backpack at Essen. Um, and it's really funny how you know, like publishing is now this big operation, but like back in the day, Alan Moon would meet a friend in. Uh, in Germany, and like he would make the games the days before, so he would have all the components and boxes, and he would assemble it all himself. Uh, so I think we've gotten a little bit away from that as a hobby, but it's still kind of a cool part of the past. Yeah, and now we've got a tournament in Vegas where people will play um, King of Tokyo for ten thousand dollars in prize money. <laughs> yeah, I'm not good at King of Tokyo, otherwise I, I should have. Had it <laughs> what a what a story when Alex, if you get a chance, watch, watch that uh, or listen to the Dukes of Dice podcast when they talk about how crazy that that trip was to Vegas with 10 or 12. I forgot what it was, over two hundred and fifty, over $500,000 in prize money. They spent $2.5 million on this tournament. I mean, I just. And so, then, I mean, did, were there that many? I, I don't know. Were there that many people that attended? Was this a profitable venture by whoever did this? I don't know. I think there was a lot of sponsorships by the by the game companies themselves. Uh, but uh, apparently it did well because they're they're gearing up for Unrivaled uh, season two. So and and it's uh, what's kind of cool about it. <clears throat> we didn't get to we we ran out of time. We didn't get to finish talking about it. I've got mixed feelings about this because I like my little hobby board gaming, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and the esports thing changes it in in some ways that I'm not so sure are going to be good. But we'll see. But the, I do like the groundswell. So you you start at your local game convention or or your yeah. local game store with just a little regional event. And then you work your way up the ladder. I think there's one or two or three spots till you get to Vegas. They paid for you though. If you won the regional event, they paid for you. They flew you out there, put you up in the Paris hotel, and then gave you a shot with 80 or 90 other people of winning 10, five or $2,500 in price money. That's awesome. I mean, it's, it's exciting to see. Um, yeah, I, I was I, I sort of saw banners for this, and I, I didn't. Re- I hate to admit this, I didn't really know much about it. Um, but it's, oh. it seems like a cool event. But it's just funny to see how much the hobby has grown because, like we just said, people were selling games at backpacks, and now you can, you know, the catch Paris it. Hotel in Vegas. Yeah. So, can I ask you a couple of questions? Yeah, sure. It's so, your show. Yeah. So, uh, no, uh, yeah, I mean, what what games looked really cool to you at Essen? I mean, you mentioned sort of the you, you said it on V. I'm not, but uh, yeah, what games 
Well, that was our, that was our pregame list. You know, the, those those six ones. That's the ones that uh, kind of caught my eye. If I if I went back to your list, um, let's see if I have that handy. Uh, shoot, Bunny Kingdom was one that was uh, was a little bit of talk and has has every week oh, seems to be getting yeah hotter and hotter. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, Is not Notre Notre Dame. Game, go ahead, the designer. So because it's Richard know. Garfield, isn't it? Yeah, it's Richard Garfield. And so I, I have a confession. I've never played Magic the Gathering. Ever. Okay. So have you, uh, have you played any Garfield games? Yeah, I've played most of his board games. Okay. Um, and I really like the great Dom Moody. Um, but uh, it, it's it's what got me into board gaming, really, from the standpoint of playing games as a kid. But I, I credit Richard Garfield away from from the Magic days. I started doing research on Magic, and that led me to to um. Uh, the one that Tom Vassell always has is top uh, one or two game um, cosmic encounter oh, because yeah. that, that was a basis for magic. And that led me to rooms, which is a, which is a game I still own, uh, which was by the same designers, but it's a word game. And then that led me to, well, what else has Richard Garfield done? Robo rally and pecking order and a couple of games like that. And I own all those. So, you know, it, it, in a way he brought me into the, and, and I'm, I know, I know I'm not the only one, but he oh, brought no. me into the, into the hobby market by, by telling all these people that that assumed that there was only Axis and Allies, Monopoly, and all those chit-filled war games, you know, but there was nothing for us. And then yeah. there's there's Richard Garfield going, "Wait a minute, you don't know anything about Cosmic Counter or all these other games, you know? You, you've never played Runes? I'm like, no, I've never even heard of these games, you know? Yeah, the reason I'm always embarrassed that I've never played Magic: the Gathering is because, you know, people say like Catan is the game that like was the ultimate gateway game. I actually think it probably is Magic: The Gathering. I think magic has probably brought more people into the hobby than anything. I just never, I've never played it. And the idea of a collectible card game is probably lost on me, but. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably a little older than you. So I started in the antiquities, Arabian nights, which is really, really, really early before legends came out. One of the first, uh, the first and second uh, expansions. It wasn't a collectible game back then. It was you buy a you buy a box, you know, you buy the deck box, and you played what's in the deck box. And we're we're doing anti. If you wanted to get other cards, you you know, you want them from other people. You know, they they ran out of cards so many times. It was hard to really be collectible. When Legends came out, and they pushed all these cards and said, "Oh, this is rare and this is not." Although that was always in the game, I'm not saying that. But Richard's idea was never that people were going to go out and buy tons and tons and tons of cards. He assumed that they were just going to buy a couple and then make a deck out of it. We literally played the deck out of our box for the first six months. You sure. you just you 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 deck build. We would deck build out of our box, take out some of the cards, uh, but but that was it. I mean, I remember my first ten games were literally. Oh, here's a black card. I can't play it because I don't own any swamps. Oh, how funny! <laughs> and, it's, and it's in my deck. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I actually, so I went to a convention back in April and I got to play with game with Dale Yu, who is the editor of the Opinion Gamers, and Eric Martin from Board Game Geek and uh, Dale's brother. And we played this game that it's a, it's a game that simulates collectible card games. And I, it's just, the name of it's escaping Millennium, um, Millennium Blades, level 99. And they sit down to play this game with me and, uh, they said, um, you know, we're going to play this collectible card game that simulates what it's like to collect a card game. And uh, I went through the experience and I'm like, I think this was lost on me because I've never, it's not, it doesn't bring up the nostalgia of what it's like to buy cards and everything for me. So Millennium Blades, which was, you know, for them, this is an amazing game because it simulates their youth. Uh, and for me, I was like, I, is this really what collecting a collectible card game is like? So. I, I, I want to play Millennium Blades so bad. My buddy Carlos left to go to Iowa and uh, took his game with me, and I was supposed to buy it, and I never did because I don't know if I'd, uh, there would be anybody to play it with. But that would bring back a lot of memories of my you know, I, my late college years. So I think, ironically, that game is now releasing so many expansions that Millennium Blades is itself now like a collectible card game. It, it is. Now, there's Dave Dugat from the – he's from the Crew to Gumbo, and he's checking in with you live, and he – and. He's picking on me. He knows that I, I like to talk about the early days of Magic, but I dropped out after that, and I was never a good uh, player. So he's making sure that you understand I was not a good Magic but, player. You know, talk about a game where there are tournaments where you can make a small fortune. I mean, it's funny to see the board gaming world moving into that like Magic has been for a long time. 
I like the idea that Magic has brought a lot of people in, but I think Steve is right. Uh, there's a lot of people. He says, me either on Magic, Chris. For me, it was AD&D, then years of nothing, and finally discovering modern board games. And I, I think there's a lot, a lot of us. I, in some ways, I am like that also, you know? Yeah, I think for me, the game that really kicked it all off was Power Grid. So, you know, I had played Catan and uh, Carcassonne, and I, Ticket to Ride really got me into it. And then I played Power Grid for the first time, and I was just in love with it. And uh, it's funny because a lot of people here in Jefferson City don't like Power Grid anymore. But I think I think there's this special thing in the hobby where we always fall in, ga- in love with the games that got us into it. And, uh, you know, I think if you look at almost any gamer's top 25, uh, there will always be five or six games in there that were among the first five or ten sure. games they played. And so, you know, it's really funny. But in, for a lot of people, that is Magic the Gathering. So. Well, for me, Ticket to Ride will always stay in the top ten, really, because it's really what excited me about the hobby. You know, t- yeah. it's probably probably the first game I bought when I knew about the hobby. Pecking Order and all those other games, I didn't know anything about the hobby. I was just buying it because of Richard Garfield. But I'm looking at your top ten on the BGG buzz list, and a couple of these are, are kind of surprising. But I'm going to ask you about one. Photosynthesis, the game I own uh, that I played, uh, that I saw at Dice Tower Con, and we, and we finally got in. But my question is. You know, a lot of the games that we see at Essen are going to be on those SDJ lists. We talked about games that are hot. We talked about games that you like, and I know it's early, but do you agree with me that photosynthesis is a potential is a front runner for the nomination? I'm not saying it's going to win, but yeah, I think yeah, if photosynthesis is all in majesty for the realm. I will be surprised if there's a game that knocks one of those three off as a nominee. Oh, so that's your three early calls, Azul. That's my three early calls. And I, I mean, I, so I'm going to do a not so humble brag. I actually host a contest on every year for guessing the Spiel des Jahres winner. Oh. And yeah, I, I host the contest. Plug it. Where, 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 do, where do people find it? Uh, uh, it? So I'll launch it in early April. Um, and then you, everybody names the games that they think will win. But I've actually won two of the past four years. And so I pretty, yeah. So, but you know, I've written, I've written a book. I mean, literally, the SDJ series is the size of a book. I've written a, a book-sized amount of writing about uh, the Spiel of Shores. But, yeah, I think Azul and... Uh, so you feel and, like you've gotten into the mind of some of these SDJ voters. Well, so. yeah, well, yeah, at least for the family weight games. The, the Kenner Spiel of Shores, like, I am the worst person in the world at guessing what they're thinking. <laughs> so, but, yeah, but Majesty and... Um, Majesty is really popular with the jury. And then there's a fourth game called Memo R. I, um, I don't even know how to say this. I see it on your website. Mem- yeah, Memo? It, it, the, Memo so I, yeah, so I actually, there's a board game blog called Reviews for Millions. That's the English name, but it's Udo Barsh's blog. He's a member of the jury. And if Udo Barsh really likes a game, it tends to get a nomination. Uh, and so uh, I bet Majesty and Azul and Photosynthesis, I think those are three of the games to watch. And I actually... Um, memo R or whatever it is, that might be the fourth. So, what what was your what was your pick for SDJ last year? Um, let's see, I I called it correctly, but I the the game that won is escaping me right now. So there was Magic Maze, of course, and there was uh, El Dorado, and there was um, um, King Domino. Yeah, I called King Domino. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that was mine. Also, I played all three. I uh, played actually. I played by by Dice Tower Con. I had played all three, and I liked all three a lot. But I thought King Domino just it seemed like an STJ win. Yeah, you know, it's actually really funny because people who follow the STJ a lot get really good at predicting it. And I think, with the exception of Splendor, I think most people have called the correct winner in most years. Um, Splendor was the year that Camel Up won, I think, and. Uh, Camel Up was, I think, the surprise that year. Uh, but most most years, yeah, it's there's always that standout game. Uh, Brandon, Brandon says number nine was robbed. I haven't played number nine yet, Brandon. I, I don't know. That's right, but the jury felt it was more of a puzzle than a game, and and they might be right on that. But it's it's the game of the list that I've played the most. Well, you've seen the show. You know what we like to do near the end of the show. Uh, we're running a little late. Do you have time to play the Envy game? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay. The Envy game, uh, sometimes we do it by themed, uh, so that's up to you. But we're looking at trying to get into your head and figure out what game would you play right now, whether you own it or not, whether you've played it or not. It's just a game that if, if we shut the computers down and said, hey, you could play any game with anybody you want, what game would that be? And we have to try to figure it out. Don't do like Ted and, and Bert the answer out. Okay, I won't. You, do you have one? Yeah, I have it. All right, good. So 
Oh, he said spelling on that fourth game for the STJ. According to your website, it's M, it's memo, and then A R R R R. Yeah, I think there's it's memo. I think there's three or four R's. Yeah, so and you could, and I did. I didn't buy the S, and you can order it from uh, Amazon Germany pretty cheaply. Uh, and so I ordered it, and it's actually already shipped. Uh, so if you're interested in that one, I uh, I would order it from Amazon.de. So now I'm competing against these guys. I'm competing against Dave and Steve and Brandon. And Brandon says, without even me asking a single question, he already knows your choice. Hey, Brandon, if you want to throw out the guess, you beat me and Steve, and you'll you'll have the record for the for the quickest on V win. If you've got it, throw it out there. So we'll we'll see if he's right. But I'll start out the questions. First off, I always ask: Is it competitive or cooperative? Competitive. It's a competitive game. Okay. Uh, is it an American designer or a European designer? And I'm going to guess it's a Euro designer, but is it American or Euro? Euro. It is a Euro designer, not a designer, design. a Euro designer. Yeah, okay. designer. Interesting. All right. So I've got about 20 questions to try to figure this out. I, I would guess it doesn't, but does it have miniatures in it? Is it a minis-based game? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. No, no. Although, hang on, I have to interrupt. Agricola is now a minis game. I don't know if you saw that expansion. So, uh, yeah. Agricola, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, Agricola now has a set of miniatures you can buy for all the characters. So, And Agricola is my all-time favorite game. And so uh, Agricola is now a minis game, I have to say that. Minis game. Mm, interesting. Okay. So it's not Agricola, obviously. No, no. <laughs> you Sorry, no, we inadvertently ruled one out. <laughs> no. So we got one gone. Um, oh, has it come out recently in the last three years? No. So it's an older game. Is it card based? I, I I don't want to give anything away. I picked a specific version of a game, but some of the versions are card based. Does Teach You have multiple games? Because I know you're a big fan of Teach You. I am a huge fan of Teach. It's not Teach You. Uh, it's not Teach You. Okay, all right. But yeah, there's Teach You Taipan, and yeah, there's all kinds. There of are games. multiple games. Is it a trick taking game? Nope. See, because I know you're a bit. I did. I did my homework. Yeah, you did. Yeah, uh, I love trick and game and social deduction. So I know you write a lot about trick taking games. That you, you guys ought to start a club. A club because there's a lot of people that are big, big fans of trick taking games. Yeah, it's it's actually really and it's growing and it's kind of amazing to me that it's growing. What do you think about this? Um, this this trend with two player uh, trick taking games. You got the one that just came out, Fox and Forest, and then another one that just came out at Essen. Yeah, I went a decade without playing a two-player trick-taking game, and then Larry Levy, which is a, a writer I really respect. Yeah, I've read him. Yeah, Larry uh, has invented two two-player trick-taking games, and both of them are fantastic. Fox, of nope. course. No. Yeah, but it's somebody. It's not Larry. It's somebody uh, that we know. Is it Scott Alms? Maybe. The um, Alms invented. Yeah. So Claim is sitting right back there. That's it. Claim. Yeah. That's the one yeah. I'm thinking of. And that's not the game, I guess, huh? Yeah, and Stephen, you're right there. It is a trick-taking renaissance going on right now. There have been more trick-taking games released this year than any year I remember. So Dave says it's Concordia. Is he right or wrong? He's wrong. He's wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we both like Concordia, and he's still – he's, I, I, the, the hint I will give is that it's a specific version of a game. Specific version of a game. Okay. Uh, it did not come out recently. Uh -huh. um, well, I can skip a couple of these questions. because It's not a legacy game. That would have to have been last time. Uh, let's see. Euro. Oh, man. You know, Steve, we got we to gotta figure out who the designer is. That's where we're going to get this guy, man. We can figure out who the designer is. It, is it a famous designer? Is it yeah. somebody we would know right away? Yeah. Uh, no, Dave, it's not. I know, we, I know why Dave's really bringing up Concordia because he won last uh, last night. So that's why he's it's, it's a little subtle dig there. Congratulations, I'm just looking at Brandon Kemp right now because actually he should – be getting this right off the bat. Oh, really? So that is a hint there, Brandon. He says you should know who this is. Let me, let me, I'm, I'm going to, uh, let me see. Let me see. Well, is it an Alan Moon game? Nope. No. Okay. I was thinking that you were talking about France. Um, or, or, or actually, I, I was going to guess when I was doing my research, I was thinking you were going to go ticket to ride the Wild West map because of your connection to, um, is it an Old West map or Wild West map? Yeah, uh, uh, Old West, I think, yeah. Dave says it's Power Grid, and he's positive about it. N not Power Grid, although that would make the top five. Hmm. Multiple versions of Power Grid. That is true, and it's and it's a game that's definitely out. I got to play it for the first time, oh, by the way, last weekend. I can see why people like it. I'm terrible at it, but it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, which is surprising because it, it was really just a math game. It is. A lot of people claim you could spreadsheet. I think the I think the auction prevents that, but uh, it is very mathy.
but I'm an old accountant. So, I mean, I like the math. Huh. Is it an award winner? Uh, yeah. One, it, one of the versions? Yeah, it won uh, the Deutscher Spiel Priest, which is a pretty big hint. German, uh, the German Game Award. Let's see. Let's see. Are the different versions rethemes? Yes. That's not my question. That's Steve. I still got plenty of questions because these guys are throwing out questions like crazy, man. Uh, let's see. It is a German Award winner. Uh, Dutch, Deutsche Spieler Prize is not like SDJ, though. It does not have to come out in Germany. They can pick any game if I remember right. Is that they correct? Can. Popular vote. Yeah, popular vote. It's basically like the Games Magazine Game of the Year with the uh, subscribers, right? Yeah, and it's, it's an interesting tid- tidbit. There was once a ballot stuffing scandal. Oh, um, I didn't know that. What, which game was that? I forget what I for, I don't remember, and I forget even what year it was. But there's no real good source for the information in English. But I would like, love to one day write an article about it. Is it a um, is it a Hans M. Gluck game? It is. That that was that got you close. Okay, the, now the version Brandon. I'm talking about is not Hans and Luke. So. Oh, it's not. The is it a Z-Man version you're talking about? Uh-uh. No. Okay. So that that that's a really good hint there for us, Steve and uh, and Brandon. It's a Hans M. M. Luke game. Hmm. You would say it is. I don't remember the answer to it, and I did not write it down. You'd say you'd say it's more card based or more board based, more board game based. Um, I don't. There are various versions, and I don't think any of them use boards. I mean, they have like a small board, but it's mostly card game, mostly cards. Was was Bonanza? The version I'm thinking of doesn't use a board or cards. Was Bonanza a Hans M. Gluck game? No, no, it's not. No, Bonanza was Amigo. Yeah, Amigo, that's right. All the different. I got Bonanza sitting up there. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that was easy to check. I don't. My, my, my collection's downstairs, so I can't look at Bonanza. So it's it's obviously not Bonanza. Um, hmm. Mm. And it's a famous designer, right? Oh, you know, is it a German designer? Uh huh. Is it is it a Juve Rosenberg game? No, nope. no. Man, famous designer. Yeah, I asked that one, Steve. That's a good question. Um, Brandon, come on. He says you know it. <laughs> no, I already asked that, Steve. It's not. It's not Uwe Rosenberg. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, let me think, think, think. And I don't want to cheat. I, I, I could look at the winners and just start uh, naming them. Um, I can I even tell you the year it won. What's that? I can even tell you the year it won. We'll see if that, do you want that info? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean I'm not going to look it up, but uh, it might help me with that. It won that. in 1992. In what year? 1992. Oh, that's a little bit. That's a little. So 95 was uh, Settlers of Catan, if I remember right. Yep. So, so this before. would be its 25th anniversary. Yeah, Brandon says he's he's out. <laughs> he thought it was teach you. Uh, oh, so Brandon, oh, dude, we've got never mind. <laughs> Steve O'Rourke says with a good question: Are these different versions, as in like t- Ticket to Ride, or are these rethemed versions? They're rethemed. So oh, different themes. So it's before Carcassonne and before uh, Catan. Brandon says he knows it now. Oh, he does? Hey, well, put it out there. You, you've got the win, Brandon. You'll have one. You'll be uh, catching up on Steve, who I think, Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think you've got two wins. Uh, I think, Steve, we, we, Steve and I compete almost every week, and he's got more than me. I think I've only won once. And, and Alex Goldsmith stumps us every time with stupid games like the McDonald's uh, Happy Meal game or something like that. <laughs> does uh, it have, is, is it an IP-based? Those re-themes, are they IP-based? No. That's Steve, a question from Steve. That's a good question. I would have never thought to ask that question. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. So it's not Uwe. Um... Well, I'm drawing a blank on my German designers, and I should know. I should know this. Um, Fister doesn't have any designs that far back, and actually, Fister is not German. He's Austrian, if I'm right. Um, I don't have anything that far back? What What's is it? Knizia. It is Kinesia. It's a Kinesia design? Uh-huh. Well, why I didn't think of that right away. Um, all right, well, I'm getting closer there now. Hey, are you guys going to help or is it going to be just me? <laughs> so it's a Kinesia. Just to recap, it's a Kinesia design. It's competitive. Uh, it's um, one of his older designs from 1992. 
20, wait a minute. Is that modern art? Is that 25 years? Modern art? Yeah, we have to get the specific version of modern art. Oh, okay. Uh, a specific version of oh, is Brandon Gibson. Yeah. <laughs> Brandon with the tip in is the designer of doctor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Reiner Canizia. So it is modern art, but but you're getting specific on us. It's a, it's there a specific a, version. I just desperately even want to see it. Okay. Is it a game you own? No. I've never physically seen a copy. Is it stamps? It is stamps. Oh, yeah. there it is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, you know, we've done, so Brandon, we've got this interview in, in the morning with Dr. Knizia and, uh, uh, you know, I've never actually <laughs> seen a version of stamps. So if I could pick any game in the world to see, it would be a copy of stamps. Last week, I would have told you it was the Dutch version of Tichu, which I didn't think actually existed. Right. Um, I'd seen pictures of it, but uh, I and I had been looking for a Dutch copy of Teach You for years, and uh, I actually managed to find two copies at Essen. So well, I had so much fun with this one because that is one Brandon should have gotten. We talked about stamps two or three yeah. times during this broadcast. Yeah. Brandon, dude, we've got an interview <laughs> in less than twelve hours about this. I love it. <laughs> that's a tough one. I will. That's right. You got that version of Teach You. That's right. You do have the Dutch version of Teach You. Yeah, I, 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 this is amazing. I actually have two copies of it now. <laughs> oh. Now, are you? You know, I've, I've listened. To, I've never played Teach You, and I've heard a lot of people just rave about it. But they tell me that it's not a fun game to play. If if Steve and me and Alex were at a convention and you were there, are you the kind of guy that is a Teach You evangelizer that likes to teach it? Or are you yeah. more one of those that no, I really like to play with experienced yeah, players? I will say this about Teach You, which I, doesn't bother me. Yeah, I love Teach You. It's one of my ten favorite games. Uh, Teach You is not a fun game to learn. It's not a hard game, but it's it's people talk about the art of Teach You, and that's really kind of a pretentious way to put it. But it is a game that an advanced Teach You player, for an advanced Teach You player, it's I like playing with newbies, but it's one of those that's really hard to play with newbies. And it's a game that if you are new, you'll make a lot of mistakes. And um, but it's it's such a cool game, and uh, it's my favorite card game. But uh, I am actually a, normally a very calm gamer, and I don't normally even care if I win. I just do, like enjoying the game <laughs> and teach you. I am a competitive jerk, and uh, you know everybody that plays teach you is a little bit like that. So, um, but no, I, I happily evangelize it, and then one of these days I will convince Brandon Kemp to learn it. So that would be fun, and I'd love to, I'd love to play with you if ever we run into each other at a convention. Yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to learn to play it. I grew up like many people in South Louisiana playing card games with your family and with your friends. We have our own games here, Bure, you know, Batai, which I think you guys know as War, uh, you know, games like that. But we played Spades and, and Hearts and all these other games and Slap and, you know, all, all these different games. So the thought of having a game like Teach You that every convention you're going to go to, there's always people playing Teach You. Yeah. I've, I've never been in a convention where there's not people playing it. Yeah, and here's the, the other, another cool, my shameless, and I'm sorry to make the show go so long, my, my shameless no. point to teach you, it's a partnership game, and you can play it without four players, but nobody really does, but it's a partnership game, and if board games are about the people you play with, you know, Teach You is my game that I play with, my sister is my partner, and if I play with my sister, we're a really good team, but if I play with anybody other than my sister as my partner, they'll want to kill me, I'll want to kill them, no. uh, but you know, Teach You is the game that reminds me of my sister, and I think partnership games are really beautiful in that regard. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, that's the coolest part of it is you can pick a person that you can get really good at it with them. Uh, and so for me, that's Jesse. So I'd love to play it. My, my fondest memories of the community college I started at, at, at during the summers and my breaks from my, from regular university was sitting in the, in the commons area. And we played hearts until the game of hearts was not the game of hearts anymore. It was the meta game of who was better at playing with other people and what signals you could say, you know, have a heart or, man, it'd be great if I had a spade because I really want to, uh, or a shovel because I really want to go dig in uh, grandpa's garden today. You know, the, those little jokes that you have are memories. I remember, I don't remember anything about LSUE, but I remember playing hearts almost yeah. every day, you know? Yeah, it's funny because, you know, we all have that game where we have so many gaming stories and for me that's teach you just because there's always that thing like nobody expected that to happen. But yeah, that's teach you and it, it's... It's a cool game, and I, I really do recommend it to everybody, especially if you've got somebody that you can, you know, partner up with, and you really play with them often. Well, man, I'm really glad you played on V, and you played it the right way. You gave us just enough tantalizing hits to keep it moving, but at the same time, letting us talk to you about all the different games. That's what that's what I like about doing the on V game. It's not really about the win. Hey, I want to thank our special guests, 
Chris Ray from Opinionated Gamers, from BGG, from a, a host of different places, including the What Did You Play This Week? Pod, it's the podcast that you work for, or you do the writing part? I right? do the writing, uh, yeah. And also, uh, how can they reach you on social media, Chris? What's the best way to get in touch with you? So uh, actually probably getting in touch with the Opinionated Gamers. I run the Twitter handle. Um, I kind of work – I don't really work in politics, but I work kind of in politics. And so I keep my social media really locked down. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's you. When I see the Twitter feed for Opinionated Gamers, that's mainly you? Yeah, that's generally me. And I'm also really easy to contact by email. It's Christopher, W-R-A-Y at gmail.com. The FBI director is also named Christopher Ray, but I beat him to the Gmail address. <laughs> you got it, huh? You got it. Oh, Chris, Chris uh, Brandon Kemp says he wants a Christopher Ray, not FBI version, on the podcast. Yeah, it'd be cooler if you got the FBI director, Brandon, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll happily come on anything. So. Well, man, I had a blast having you on there. Good luck with the reviews and the writing. Keep the history coming. I'm a history major from a college, so it's my favorite part of the hobby is reading th these stories about how games are developed or the some of the controversies uh, about the way things happened. Uh, so I love reading that. Yeah, and you know, keep up the good work on the on your um, video interviews. Uh, when somebody's writing game histories, there's nothing in the world as valuable as the sort of things that you do. So if I ever write a you know a history of any of Ted Allspock's games or something, checking out his you know his video would be awesome. These are the these are the sort of things that you know, keep the record alive. So thank you. And, you know, this was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. And you're, you're welcome to come back anytime. If there's a game or a game history you want to talk about, come on back. All right, board gamers. I'm BJ from Board Game Gumbo. This has been another episode of Gumbo Live with special guest Chris Ray. And until next time, Chris, laissez le bon temps rouler. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. You too.